AI systems are biased. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is bias yeah. in those outputs, but actually us as humans, we're biased. Yes, exactly. And this bias is visible in data, and this is reproduced by AI systems. Mm. Hello, everybody. And Welcome to our Envision and Beyond series. My name is Maya Valencia de Backhaus from the Intelligent Enterprise Institute, and today we're joined by Nicole Bittner. Um, she's the CEO and founder of Merantix Momentum and uh, entrepreneur, economist, thought leader in everything related to artificial intelligence, and we're so happy that we can have a few minutes together with you. So welcome, Thank you. Nicole. Thank you so much for the invitation. We would like to discuss with you a few points on artificial intelligence, maybe what all the misconceptions are and the potential for business and also from the human aspect of every organization, which is the people working in there. And uh, while I was doing a little bit of research, you refer to yourself as a tech optimist. Um, what do you mean by that exactly? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a tech optimist. I'm really excited about the possibilities of technology and what you can build with it because I'm, I'd say my primary interest is not necessarily technology, but humans. Mm. I really like humans and I really like to build solutions that are useful to humans and humankind. But I'm very, very optimistic that um, technology is a really great instrument to build some of these solutions. When we think about how can we solve problems related to um, sustainability, to mm. healthcare, to education on a scalable global level with limited resources, I think AI is going to be um, one of the main answers. Oh, that's such a good segue because we would like to understand what is the true potential of artificial intelligence and what is it bringing to our, to our business and mm -hmm. to our daily lives? I think many different things. So one, one thing is, as I mentioned, the scalability aspect. So we can basically design products that can be scalably personalized. Uh, think about education and the way you um, get taught content, right? Maybe you, your child likes uh, monkeys a lot. Yeah. So maybe all the math content can be contextualized using things that your kid likes. Mm. Um, think about healthcare, right? There are many people in the world who don't have access to healthcare. Artificial intelligence can make this accessible for larger people at lower, uh, for larger amounts of people at a mm. much lower cost base. And also when you think about ultra personalization of these solutions like healthcare. And um, finally, sustainability, which is also, I think, a really important um, yeah. aspect, is um, we have limited resources. We need to work with new materials, and mm. AI can actually help us build these new materials and, and be more efficient with the way we're using the planet's resources. Yeah, sustainability is one of the topics that is a trend that keeps on coming, mm -hmm. and future of work is another one that mm -hmm. I think that AI also is going to have some impact. Um, could you tell us a little bit more on what the potential is for AI augmenting the capabilities that humans have today, not mm -hmm. only in their individual part, but maybe within the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think AI, right, is kind of like, like with all technology, the human has kind of um, a weird relationship to technology because mm. it kind of seems like it can pose a threat to what you're doing. I think it's going to augment people and organizations a lot. And to be frank, there are also a lot of organizations out there who cannot get hold of enough people anymore and are, sh yeah. are facing shortages. Um, I think there are different chapters. For the last, let's say, 20 years, when we looked at AI, we saw a lot of the um, classifying, um, sort of um, summarizing, um, understanding data better use cases. Yeah. So, for example, we built at Marantic some startup like in breast cancer diagnostics. So understanding, is there, are there cancerous cells in your mammography or not? Now with generative AI, this has changed dramatically, mm. right? This, in this old world, and that was already generating a lot of value, I would say we tapped into about 1% of the value chain. Yeah. Now with generative AI, we're tapping into, into the other 99% mm. because now we can understand context, we can actually create new content, we can generate solutions, and this is tapping into much wider parts of job profiles. So, this is good and it's also challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, good news is um, a lot of stuff that also I'm personally doing, we can now automate and get assistance, mm. right? And decision support, decision, sort of a lot of proposals. I can get a lot of proposals for solution. I can kind of spar with technology, um, tap into, for example, knowledge management solutions, yeah. right? I can, I can see 
that I can uh, make knowledge much more accessible, more easily and intuitively to people. Mm. Um, we've seen the, the user interface is super smooth. I can yeah. use natural language. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm an economist. I'm also not a data yeah. scientist, mm -hmm. so this is great. <laughs> um, at the same time, it's sort of, um, yeah, it, it means not that us hum that we are going to be um, superfluous, but that some of the tasks we're doing, we will no longer do. Mm. And, you know, when you're touching people's workflows, obviously there are also emotions uh, that come yeah. up and, you know, we need to deal with that. And, and um, I think fundamentally that's what's, that's what's going on. And, and this is especially so since we're talking also about a lot of uh, white collar jobs. Yes. Right. I think that's also something, uh, it's kind of an elephant in the room. We've been talking about blue collar automation for mm. decades. Um, white collar um, automation, not so much. And now it's touching accountants and lawyers yeah. and you know journalists and everybody's like, "Woo, what's this Data doing to my analysis, job?" Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think we're we're gonna work differently, and it means sort of understanding what it is you're good at individually, and then how to um, also retrain um, people and um, build careers within organizations is going to be completely different for, for companies. Yeah, I can imagine that the skill sets that the new generation needs to bring, the, the new workforce generation, is going to be different now that we have all these tools and they are growing up with them, around mm -hmm. them. So what do you think is important for them to have instead of uh, uh, the usual uh, mm -hmm. learning careers that we mm -hmm. both have to the new generation when it comes to AI to leverage more from them? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure I have like a really good answer to this <laughs> or the silver bullet. Um, but let's say there are two things we can observe. So there is one uh, element of having faster access to knowledge. So for people who haven't been in a domain for that long, um, so for very junior people, very young people, all of a sudden you can be onboarded much more quickly and individualized, right? So you can basically be fed the information you need for a specific context, right? when you need it. Mm. And you potentially don't have to look everywhere and find out which colleague can tell you about this yeah. and that and where is this folder, etc. So this can actually enable you much quicker mm. early on, which is, which is really right. cool. Yes. Um, at the same time, in a world where you get offered a lot of, um, let's say, proposals for decisions, I think also decision making and management, so also experience mm. will be quite valuable. Because okay. at the end, you still have to make judgment calls mm. and decisions. Okay, where are we actually going? Yes, this is what generative AI proposes, or this is, you know, um, this this is a possible pathway. But then we actually have to take decisions. Where are we going to go? Yeah. Um, so I think at the same time, we're going to see that this judgment and discernment is also mm. going to increase in value. So I think interesting and and good news for say both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, so you need to be better at critical thinking, the mm -hmm. way that you are assessing the information that you're receiving maybe. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. It's going to differ from what we're used to, just to learn by heart everything yes. and then um, give it away. That's, um, you mentioned also uh, Merantics and all what you're doing for the um, startup community within mm -hmm. Berlin, but also for other companies. How could they leverage more from these technologies and really make the best use out of, of artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I can reflect on this, like what's happening in our own organization, mm. right? We're four years old and we have a lot of coders that are, you know, different engineers, machine learning engineers, full stack, front end, <laughs> data uh, analysts and so, so, so on. And um, yeah, I mean, we've really seen that these, uh, these um, co-pilot functions are amazing. Mm. So it's changing the productivity of our, of yeah. our developers quite drastically. And, um, and also what they're focusing on. So we believe that sort of very transactional, simple statement of work where I can define um, very precisely what I want, that's going to be a prompt. Mm. And there's not going to be a developer actually executing this. Yeah, You're going to right. prompt a, a system. And of course, this changes how we think about team composition mm. and, 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 and skills and also developer um, development, yeah. <laughs> personal development. Um, so that's just for me. So I think it's an incredible productivity tool. And since, um, and, and maybe a second part is, I think generative AI in total has led to two things. One, the barrier of entry to actually create applications is lower. Mm -hmm. Because the effort you have to put in to train a system is a little bit lower. Say, I want to do something on a, with language. Yeah. I can now take a foundation model in language, a large language model, and fine tune it with my 
expertise or angle, and I have a much better solution with lower effort probably. Mm. Uh, so that's going to mean we're, we can create more applications more easily. And the second part is, since I can use natural language as an access point and as yeah. an interaction, I also have a much wider base of, app, of, of users, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't need to be a data scientist. I don't need to know how to read code to interact with this before. I mean, GPT has been around for a while. So yeah. before, I mean, you just had to make the right AP, call the right API and you could also use the technology. Now I can just type it in and soon, you know, we're going to speak to the technology. So yeah. it's very accessible. So this means also for organizations, um, you can enable a lot of different user groups, right? White color, blue color, uh, speaking any language, and that's incredibly powerful. Yeah, I think that's amazing also how fast uh, in the last couple of months generative AI has been uh, not only a topic of conversation, but also how companies are adopting this. Um, but it's true that it's a big hype at the moment. Um, how can companies see the true potential and, and maybe distinguish from the existing hype that we have mm. um, going on within any industry and all industries? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, let's say I'm a little bit biased on this one. In general, <laughs> I like the hype because um, I would say structurally, at least in, in, in some geographies, and I would say Germany and Europe is part of that, we're not moving as fast yeah. in AI adoption as we need to. So I think a little bit of hype is a good wake-up call yeah. for people to start moving faster. However, you're completely right. You, know, right. you don't want to blindly just go like, oh, let's do more of this, and then you don't get value out of it. Mm. And then in the end, the answer is quite trivial. You need to assess business value okay. and, and think about not let's do AI, but let's use AI for a certain purpose. Mm. And you need to define that purpose okay. and have that clear. And with if you have a target and a vision in mind, then it's easier to kind of say, okay, can we do it? So do we actually have feasibility? Do we actually have the data and infrastructure needed to employ this technology? Mm -hmm. And then um, also, is AI the right tool? Yeah. Right? And, and I think that's important to kind of step back and say, okay, yes, we want to be part of this, but we also need to prioritize our resources within an organization and, mm -hmm. and choose the right topics to work on with this technology. Yeah, I think purpose and the, val the value that you would like to generate is is key, right? Um, totally, but a lot, a lot of times w we kind of forget that, right? We kind yeah. of get caught up. It's a, it sounds like a good idea, and um, yeah, it's then sometimes hard to let go of that idea, and then you know, mm. all of a sudden you're caught up on a project that maybe doesn't make that much sense, doesn't yeah. really move the needle for the organization as much yeah. as it should. Yeah, that's true. I think that we're used with our behavior and not being agile enough and just keep on following a plan that we had originally mm -hmm. without uh, analyzing if the value is still mm -hmm. the one that we assess at the very beginning. Um, but there is an evolution for uh, companies and for corporates and the uh, whole business to uh, follow also how these tools are supporting us. <laughs> what is the evolution of of AI, how is generative AI also being changed and, and developed and in which direction is it going? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so with generative AI, I mean, we're now talking about a lot of models that have to do with language. Mm -hmm. So large language models is what everybody's talking about right now. We already very clearly see multimodality, right? We see this, these models are going to be used for images, for videos, for yeah. code, for all sorts of things, and they're going to be combined models. Um, as well. So I think that's one very clear um, trend that we're seeing. The second one is at the moment we're seeing a lot of applications that are trained on data that's accessible, let's say, on the internet, in the public mm. domain. Um, whether, yeah, you know, there are ongoing <laughs> kind of court conversations yeah. on them, whether that use is legitimate or not. Let's see what happens. But mm. let's say this data is in the public domain. Um, I think foundation models are here to stay and we're going to start building them on enterprise data. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start looking at data pools that are not in public domain, but are what's the foundation model for drug discovery? What's the foundation model for supply chain management? What's the foundation model um, for you know um, credit uh, ranking and so on? So we're going to start seeing them being built on data pools that are right now sort of within the realm of the enterprise. Yeah. And that's... Um, going to be also a great chance for existing companies to leverage their data in a very effective way. Mm. Um, but also, I think, means that um, you need to collaborate with other companies because you need a, a lot of data to build a foundation model. Mm. And um, I mean, I know you're a big company, so maybe you have enough data, <laughs> but um, um, I, would, I would just make the claim that not a lot of companies and potentially no single yeah. company will have enough data to build a foundation model purely on their own data. Mm. And this will mean we have to think in ecosystems. 
and think, uh, you know, along our value chain. How can we um, integrate with our suppliers and our customers? Maybe we even have to talk yeah. to competitors to build, you know, win-win situations because we wouldn't individually be capable of building a powerful solution. So I think there is a lot of things that will also have to change in, in mindset mm. to yeah. really fully um, unleash the potential of the technology. Yeah, I can imagine that also based all your, uh, how you're teaching and training a system with your own data can create a lot of bias also within the information that you are uh, exposing then. Um, mm. How could companies also avoid this uh, bias or also make the information that they have more diverse and also the results that mm. they are getting? Yeah, I think it's a really important point that you're hitting there on um, bias and diversity, right? There is one obvious, I mean, there's a lot of advantages to having scalable solutions, but ultimately it's few people building solutions for many. Yeah. Right? I don't know how many hundred developers build systems that are now being used by hundreds of millions of users. Mm. And so we need to pay attention to who yeah. this group of people are that mm. are building it. And we're all biased. Let's face yes. it, and we all have our unconscious bias. So we need to pay attention um, that we have a group that's uh, diverse and that we actually build solutions that are inclusive. Mm. We don't have too many blind spots um, mm. building this, but that we actually build build technology for you know, everybody out there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, teams have to be more diverse. We need to think about you know um, geography, ethnic background, religious, but political, you know, all sort of yes. things that impact these systems. Mm. Um, especially because there are curation layers built into some mm. of them, right? There's a difference between a foundation model um, and then a promptable um, direct-to-consumer product where okay. there has gone a lot of curation into it. So there were actually people saying, oh, the output for this prompt is good or not. Mm. And by that... Mm. The judgment. Have uh, a judgment and by that impose their view and their expertise mm. on, onto a system. So, it might be biased, it might not be. Likelihood is, yeah. it, it will be biased in some sort of way. And so to try not to get that completely wrong and try to design systems that avoid um, bias being scaled horribly is, is important. And, and you know, I think another aspect is these systems still, also generative AI relies on mechanisms that basically reproduce statistical properties of existing data. Mm -hmm. um, the most famous example is always is hiring. So you look at people who are successful in an organization and then you look at their, I don't know, demographics mm -hmm. and maybe you come up with a very homogenous group just because historically yes. these have been the people included in these jobs and successful at these jobs. Mm. And we need to decide as societies and organizations and companies and individuals, yeah. are, is that actually, do we want to continue writing this past into the future or do we want to change this? Yeah. And if we want to change it, then the past data is maybe not so helpful. Yeah, that's true. And that's a normative call that mm. we all need to make. Mm. Yeah, the historical aspect of uh, the things that we are using in order to solve future problems is maybe a critical one. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to AI, and as you were mentioning before, there are a lot of misconceptions at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. mostly because of the hype that it has been created. So what are most of the misconceptions that you see that you that it's maybe uh, needed to clarify or... Uh, <laughs> Ooh, what are most of the misconceptions? <laughs> so um, I would say one thing is um, I just uh, in, install an AI and it learns all by itself. Mm. There are highly trained teams <laughs> of like machine learning, learning engineers, you know, fine tuning, calibrating systems and making sure that there is, um, that the systems actually still output valuable um, valuable answers um, or decisions. Mm. So the, one example would be like you're driving around in your autonomous driving car and yeah, yeah the camera just kind of sees more data and kind of auto automatically learns, yeah. but mm. maybe it only sees motorway. <laughs> but <laughs> what you're trying to avoid is an accident with pedestrians. Yes. So you need to calibrate these models that they still have enough relative, at least speaking, mm. data on those critical situations. Um, that would be one simple example. Um, the second one is, um, the second one for existing companies is we have enough data. Don't worry, data is not an issue. Data is usually messy. It's caught up in many, many different systems. Yeah. Often it's, a lot of the work is still on data engineering, data mm. cleaning, contextualizing data. So I think that's the second, second misconception. Um, and, you know, I think one, a third one, because I mean, ar around fears is, 
there is, I mean, for sure the change is very fast. And I mean, this has been like the last six months have been yeah. kind of one after news, news and one headline hitting, um, hitting, hitting after the other. But um, I think ultimately there will be a lag for mm. better or for worse between what's technically feasible okay. and the speed at which organizations and humans can adopt this, yeah. right? Just because it's technically possible, it will probably not happen tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> it will probably happen and probably faster, um, uh, you know, faster than we than we might think. But it's also there is a, a natural sort of um, lag in this as well mm. because organizations can adopt so much. Data quality is what it is. There are like yeah. IT systems this has to fit into, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I can imagine that the the level of data you were mentioning, the way that it's harmonized, it's uh, mm. it's not everywhere mm -hmm. the same. Yeah. We have uh, local issues too because we're talking about global uh, mm. expectations, and mm. I can imagine how the demand is going to be yeah. higher yeah. in a few months. And uh, and you know, sorry, even the misconception about like AI systems are biased. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is bias yeah. in those outputs, but actually. Us as humans, we're biased. Yes, exactly. And this bias is visible in data, and this is reproduced by AI systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are the ones training. We're the, the one tra we're the ones in the real world training it. Sorry, that's why mm -hmm. I just wanted to add this. This was no, important no, to me. I think that's really good because we tend to, um, and working in a, as, as SAP, as a company in the IT world, um, the, you tend to give guilt to the system or to mm -hmm. the to the computer itself, to the program. But at the end, the person in front is also the one that is feeding information, entering the data, and defining the quality of what is going to be calculated at the end. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that you mention that uh, the system is a neutral objective thing, that it's been trained by mm -hmm. maybe biased uh, information and people. Mm. I work in the area of networks, and, uh, and I think that um, if we see also artificial intelligence, generative AI as one of uh, the enablers in order to make all this purpose and all this value added for businesses mm -hmm. is the way to, to treat it. Mm -hmm. And many people just see as we need to have AI as a, as a solution, as a tool, but for what? What is the, exactly. the purpose at the end? What is the business benefit that you're going to get out of? And, uh, and don't understand that technology is just the way to get there and you sh should use it as a tool mm. and not as the purpose itself. Um, yeah, I also see it similarly. And I, and I think that means also organizations and also societies, we need to educate ourselves about these technologies so we can actually have discussions about these normative things. What are the goals? Yeah. What don't we want to get wrong? What, how do we want these, the future to look like? Yeah. Right? That's then the important conversation to have. And, uh, and then we can set a normative frame. And also, good news, that's something AI can't do, because AI yeah. can't do ethics. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and that's then you know, basically what, what we can uh, focus on or something where we, where we have a very relevant conversation. For mm. sure. So what is your take that you could give our listeners who are uh, within corporate worlds that are uh, looking forward to what generative AI is, is going to bring, how they can use and leverage these tools the most, mm. and what they can do in order to get at the speed of how things are mm -hmm. moving today. Yeah, so so maybe, um, maybe I mean, this is a, a, it's a German company. I grew up in Germany. I think one thing is, um, like, engineering and tech is different and this is like <laughs> fast-paced tech and it's, yeah. it's it's very disruptive and it's not incremental so I was asked earlier today so um, can you do a timeline when, when is the when is it done and I'm like it's not gonna be done we're gonna have like release three then yeah. <laughs> and there will probably be 70 more yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's an important thing this not to think too incrementally mm -hmm. but to allow this disruptive um, thought processes as well I think another thing is um, the challenges are very complex, right? And, and the, the topics you're dealing with. And so linear ways of thinking mm. about them don't work. You need to think in networks and ecosystems. So probably also with AI adoption, generative AI adoption, you will not be able to solve this all by yourself. You will need an effective network of partners and an ecosystem mm. that you have to be good at connecting to. Right, working with startups, oh, they have this thing. Oh, working with you know, yeah. uh, SAP, they have this component that I need. Mm. Ah, and this we're going to build ourselves because we're domain experts here. This is something we're going to build, yeah. you know, on our own. And I think you need to think about the world like this because otherwise, you, it's going to be too fast and too much for one single organization to digest. Yeah. And I think um, maybe a, a third one would be 
you know, you need to um, have these sort of processes and connectors more. Yeah. So I mean, when we think about it as a, even as an AI company, that's kind of all we do all day, um, we would think, okay, I mean, maybe this model is now the best. Who knows which one will be yeah. the best in six months. So we need to have processes within our software development um, um, guidelines that we know, okay, if this model is no longer the best, we change these three lines of code. And that means we need to know our processes mm. well and master those on how to assemble different building blocks yeah. that are changing all the time. And I think that's important also as an organization to, uh, yeah. To stay modular and agile. Yeah, to stay mm. modular like that, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And speed is part of the strategy. Start with it, um, educate people, talk about it because there is hesitation, there are reservations. There is also fear and uncertainty and mm. you know that triggers a lot of things in people. So you need to start the conversation today. Yeah. <laughs> Because uh, it's better to be proactive about it and incorporate people and, and, and your teams than kind of react. being in defensive and reactive mode. So mm. speed yeah. is part of the strategy. Um, what are other aspects that you would like to, to give to our listeners before we, we close our series mm -hmm. today? So maybe um, a little bit on uh, my own note. So we are also building an AI ecosystem here in, in Berlin. You're also part of it. Mm. And, and uh, for all those companies out there who are not sure how to take the first steps, there is help out there, right? I mean, Mirantix Momentum does this. There are also other great companies that can provide you with help and just maybe tomorrow go find your ecosystem that, is, that, you, know, that you think you fit into and start this conversation mm. um, with somebody. I think the point that you're mentioning that uh, companies need to start right away and not mm. wait until the mm -hmm. technology catches you, it's very important. So how can companies then start uh, yeah, joining, exploring, and uh, yeah, exploring the whole AI world. Mm -hmm. I think one thing to keep in mind is you don't have to do everything at once by yourself. I mean, the company I'm running, Rantix Momentum, we help companies do this. There are also other um, service providers, startups that help companies on this sort of path and make uh, sense, sort of find the light in this jungle of technology. Um, and I think the most important message is to basically start connecting to those ecosystems. We're building one here in Berlin. That's the Morantix AI campus. You're also yeah. part of it. And um, there are a lot of different startups and you can kind of come there with your data team or, you know, have uh, one or two day workshops and just kind of dibble your feet in the, in your, in your, in the water and then kind of uh, get more used to it and, and, and start accelerating this journey. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for this insightful conversation. And I'm so happy that we cover all the topics that our, our listeners wanted to know when it comes to generative AI and AI itself. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening to our Ambition and Beyond series. We hope to see you soon in another uh, interview with another thought leader within the tech world. Goodbye. <laughs>